have nothing, nothing but gushing things to say about Luis Ortiz, and I find that to be unsettling. Good morning to you. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer Daily Shots of Steelers and Penguins where you found this. Ortiz pitched the first two innings of the Pirates' 7-4 to victory over the Orioles yesterday in Grapefruit League play, and he did the stuff that he does. He threw 98 miles an hour, like right out of the chute, because that's what this extraordinary young man does, rolling out of bed, never mind showing up for spring training. For anyone who doesn't know this sort of thing, starters and even relievers – will use the earlier phases of the spring to gradually ramp up their velocity. doesn't mean that they've taken the off-season off or anything like that. But especially the veterans, but even the youngsters will show up and say, hey, listen, I'm going to I'm going to be at around 94, 95, 96, meaning if you're a guy who can hit triple digits the way Ortiz can. And then I'm just going to keep getting up there. No, no, no. He just took the mound and started firing gas. And the Orioles, at the same time, their hitters aren't used to seeing that this time of spring. They most certainly weren't seeing it down in Sarasota in their live batting practices. So the outcome was pretty much what you'd expect it to be. A couple of zeros and a whole lot of dominance. Does it mean much? I mean, yes and no. Results-wise, no. Potential-wise, sure it does. Sure it does. He's special. He is special. We saw that, you and I, last summer when he came up. Uh, When he came up seemingly out of nowhere, he hadn't been on any, any, any top prospect lists. Not top 10, not even top 20. He was 22, according to Baseball America. But he was beginning to do this sort of thing in Altoona. He was ramping up. He found something. He unlocked something. This does happen to younger players, which is why it's always, always good and cautionary to remind yourself that prospects can get better the same way they can get worse. This one broke through to another level. And for as critical as I am at times of Ben Charrington, And his staff, I loved the move at the time to bring him to Pittsburgh and just let him get a feel. Let him build up some confidence going into the offseason that, hey, I wasn't just doing this because I was in double A. I can get this done against the best of the best. And he did that. He did that with a couple of starts that he made for Pittsburgh. Here's what Derek Shelton had to say to reporters in Bradenton yesterday about Ortiz's outing. Yeah, I mean, just came back. And I think that's the, you know, the thing that we've talked about is continuing to make sure you you stay within yourself and go after guys. And he got behind and, and was able to come back and execute pitches. So I think is a really encouraging sign. Now, here's the part you don't want to hear. Ortiz isn't going to be in Pittsburgh to start the season. There's almost, I should say, nothing he can do in spring training to make the team right away. Now, Shelton has gone out of his way to make clear that neither Henry Davis nor Andy Rodriguez are going to make the team. He hasn't stated that explicitly regarding Ortiz, but when you pick up the dialogue and and pair it together between what Charrington said and what Shelton said, and then on top of that, the vibes from when you're down there, they know who their five starters are going to be. And None of them are going to be Ortiz, Quinn Priester, or Mike Burroughs. They're all going back to Indianapolis. They're all going to be tasked with showing that they're ready for the next level with certain check marks that they've got to check off. Now, one policy that Charrington has held in place ever since he's become the GM is he does not like to share developmental specifics, meaning what it is that the team is trying to impose on a guy, meaning real, real, real specifics, the laser specific stuff. 
he'll say something like, we want to see more strikes or we want to see fewer walks or nebulous, you know, things like that. In Ortiz's case, they want to make sure, and I mean really, really, really sure, that the four-seam fastball command is there. That much I've heard. If you're going to throw it 100, that's awesome. you got to put it where you want. And it's great that he was able to do that in double-A. It's great that he was able to have a, just a tiny, tiny, tiny micro sampling of success in the majors to build up that confidence. But he's got to show the four-seam command. The rest of his stuff is going to happen. He has a chance to allow it to mature a little bit down there. This is not going to be something, again, that people are going to like. He is going to be this year's Rowanzi Contreras, meaning in the public eye. You're going to see, hear, and read everybody complaining, why is that guy down there when we're throwing fill in the blank? Vince Velasquez has a bad start. J.C. Brubaker has a bad start. Anybody has a bad start, you're going to be, well, why is Luis Ortiz down there? I have taken that side in the past. I've even attached it to the punting concept that I keep bringing up. That one of these days, the Pirates are going to get past punting on these sorts of processes when it comes to Super 2 and uh, keeping someone in the minors for financial reasons. This won't be one of them. This will, In fact, I'll say the same thing about Priester and Burroughs. All three of them can legitimately benefit from their time in Indianapolis, and I certainly hope that they do. When we come back, J1Q. This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern that's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone, an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800 degree stone and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Today's J1Q comes from David who asks, is it possible to reconfigure the field in Bradenton to match the dimensions of PNC Park. Some teams do this with their spring training facility, and it makes sense. The Red Sox and the Cubs are two that come to mind. David, I'm going to guess that you're responding, although you didn't say this, to Kebrian Hayes' reference that I played on this show yesterday to his home run at Lee Com Park potentially having been a double if he'd hit it at PNC Park because he would hit it to the north side notch. I'm not going to lie. I I think about stuff like this myself, especially when I'm at the Red Sox new place in Fort Myers, which is it really doesn't look at all like Fenway. I think that's something of a mythology. It actually looks like an airplane hangar. It's really kind of ugly. But they do have a simulated monster in left, and they have a couple other quirks to their outfield that kind of line up with Fenway. I have no idea what the Cubs do since they're out in Arizona. I've never done a Cactus League game of any kind. But I can see that as it relates to McKechnie, with one great big exception that completely kills the conversation. And that is that Bradenton might be the windiest city I've ever spent any significant time in. And as evidence of that, you can go back over the last 30 years worth of spring training data and find that no place has given up more home runs than Bradenton has, even though the dimensions are about as sterile as it gets. Just Three River Stadium-like across the board, if you want to draw a parallel to a Pittsburgh facility, 335, 400, 335, the alleys are all the same. No surprises, except for one. The ball goes up into the air at a certain height, and there it goes. Depending on the wind that day, it will go out, and it will go out at an almost comical path. Like, you'll see what you'll see. Uh, outfielders. Oh, I can't even tell you how many times I've witnessed this. And and I'm sure anybody who's listening to this who's seen spring ball down there knows what I'm talking about. 
Outfielders will come in. They'll even come in several steps. And then they turn around and hightail it back. And then they just give up. They just like, watch it go. Because there's nothing else to to do. Uh, The home run totals are so high, even though the Pirates obviously have not been a power hitting team for, oh, about 30, 40 years now. The Pirates haven't had anyone hit even 40 home runs since Willie Stargell's 44 back in the mid-70s. So something doesn't quite add up there, and you wouldn't get anywhere near the kind of impact that it sounds like you're hoping for, David, which is that your outfielders would get used to this or that or running toward this notch or uh, you know, playing off a 21-foot wall in right or something like that. It just wouldn't matter at all. There'd be nothing to gain from it. There really wouldn't. Not offensively and not defensively. And to further buttress that point, if you only did what the Red Sox did in terms of putting a simulated monster up, if you put up a simulated Clemente wall, for example, you wouldn't be replicating the hardest part of being an outfielder in front of the Clemente wall, as anyone will tell you who's played out there, including visitors. It's not about playing the carom. It's about reading which part of the wall is made of the mesh green fence, which part is made out of the harder actual wall surface, because the ball will come off very, very, very differently depending on where specifically it hits. Something Gregory Polanco and I used to talk about a lot. Where Polanco got, he wasn't the greatest defender, to say the least, but he got really good at that. He was able to go back there and see if the ball hit off of the fence part, it was just going to die and drop down onto the track. But if it was going to hit the hard part, he knew right away to start backtracking. Um, You're not going to do all that in Bradenton. You're just not. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Pirates. We'll do another one of these tomorrow. 